Okay, so the ultimate goal for today is to solve Laplace's equation on the unit circle. So we're going from 1D problems to 2D problems, which is very exciting because PDEs are all about complicated domains and all of that sort of thing. But to get there, we have to take a few intermediate steps that are quite meaningful on their own. And the first step will be to complexify the Fourier series. So far we have stated the Fourier series in terms of cosines and sines. And you have to admit, it's a little bit unsatisfying. Because there are three different kinds of terms, constant, cosine, and sine. There are three different formulas for determining the coefficients. And not only that, the coefficient in front here is 1 over 2 pi, where every, everywhere else it's 1 over pi. So there's just something unsatisfying about the Fourier series in this form. But if we switch to complex exponentials, all of these problems will go away. And instead of being unsatisfying, it will actually be deeply satisfying. So let's get there. Let's see what the Fourier series will look like, the formula and the coefficients, the series itself and the coefficients, if instead of dealing with trigonometric functions, we dealt with equivalent complex exponentials. Okay, so we'll use this as our starting point, and that'll give us an idea of what's possible. And then we'll rederive the equivalent uh, formulas for the coefficients. And you might think that it can't possibly be worth it because the function, and for the course of this discussion, we'll assume that the function is a real function. So the function is real, but we're representing it in complex terms. It seems like it's not worth the effort. Well, it's very much worth the effort, and you will see, as you will see. And the fact that this function is real will simply yield very attractive symmetries, as they're called. So you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So let me go from here to the complex version of the same thing, and let's just see what happens. So what I'm going to do first is represent the cosine as a sum of the two complex conjugate complex exponentials. If you, if you will recall, and, you were, and I put it on the midterm just so that it's fresh in your mind, Cosine of an angle is e to i that power, i times that angle, plus e to the minus i that angle divided by 2. So that's what we'll end up in, in case of the cosine. In the case of sine, it's minus, and you have to divide by 1 over 2i instead of 1 over 2. So that's what I'm going to do silently. I'll plug that in here, and then we'll take a step back and look at what we've got. Here we go. Very nice. Okay, very nice. Well, I don't know if it's very nice yet. It's going to be very nice in just a moment. Right now, maybe it's less nice than it was. But here's what we're going to do now. We're going to collect the like exponentials. So I'll combine e to the i and alpha, this e to the i and alpha, with, e, with this e to the i and alpha. So let's see what we get. In parentheses, we'll have a sub n. And now you have to realize that 1 over i is minus i. You guys are with me on that? So it'll be minus i b n. Because I want to write the complex numbers in the more standard form. So minus i b n. Now it's plus, right? Because of this minus, and I'm bringing i to the top, it's plus i b sub n. Now, here is what I'm going to do in place. But before I do that, I would like to remark that we started with a real expression, then we broke up the real cosines and sines into complex sum, sums of complex conjugate pairs. And that complex conjugate pairing is still present in this expression. Because 
this guy is a complex conjugate of this, and this is clearly a complex conjugate of this. So this whole term is complex conjugate of this. In fact, the whole, this whole summation is the complex conjugate of this entire summation, and so the result remains real. But I will take this a step further. I will kind of apparently, for the moment, break that complex conjugate pairing. Because what I really want is to have like exponentials. I want these guys to be e to plus i n alpha, just like these guys, so I can put them together into a single sum. And that I can do with a simple renaming. It's not even renaming, it's re-indexing this sum. Instead of going from 1 to infinity, I'll go from minus 1 to minus infinity, and I will write minus n. Does that make sense? And when I write minus n, pay attention, this becomes minus n. This becomes minus n, but this becomes plus i n alpha. And that's when I go from minus 1 to minus infinity, but by convention I have to write it as minus infinity to minus 1. And now they look like two series that I can combine into one. So we're going to come up with some names. We're going to call this, of course, C sub n. And then this would be C sub minus n, I guess. Yeah, that works. C sub minus n. I don't even have to write it because if this is C sub n, then this is by definition is C sub minus n. And so now you will see that I have a series from minus infinity to minus 1, the zeroth term is missing, and then from 1 to infinity. But of course the zeroth term is not missing, it's still right here. I will call this, I will just rename it C0. And now I have a very homogeneous sum from minus infinity to plus infinity. And it looks like this. All right, we have C sub n here, C sub n here. So it's just C sub n, right? And C sub zero is in here because the zero term is included as well. E to I n alpha, because that's common for both terms. <laughs> that's it. Feast your eyes on the beauty of this expression. And the interesting question is, well, what's the formula for C sub n? And of course, you can derive it by simply plugging it in here. We know what C sub n is. It's E, well, it's right here. And when you plug it into, and when you plug these expressions into, the, into what C sub n is, you will discover that C sub n is given by this. Okay. So, I'll mention this fact, that you see the complex conjugate in here. Now, I mean, that may be slightly unexpected, right? Kind of everything is going so smoothly, you might expect to see e to the i in alpha, but because of, for, because of this minus, when you put these two together in that combination, you realize you have the complex conjugate here. And there is absolutely no coincidence. In fact, you will get used to this complex conjugate be there, being there. It's actually very natural. It's almost like you find in life that you often do something opposite to achieve the final effect. When you take a picture, old style picture with film, you get a negative, and then you have to flip it again to get the positive image. So that this negativity as an intermediate step happens very frequently. And this is one of those, and this is one of those real life effects. That's one perspective on it. Another perspective on it is you would see it if you said, let's ignore these. Let me just say that I'm looking for a series in these terms. 
and following the same procedure as we did before extracting these terms, I will try to follow an analogous procedure by multiplying both sides of f sub alpha, f of alpha equals this. And then you would realize that for that trick to work, in other words, for all the terms to drop out, except the one that you're interested in, you would have to multiply by the complex conjugate. So they more or less, quote unquote, cancel each other. And when you do the integral, it brings out C sub n. That's another perspective. I, I seriously recommend doing that. And you'll realize that to extract that one coefficient, you have to multiply by the complex conjugate and not by the exponential itself. That's a second perspective. And finally, the third perspective will come when you see all of this from the point of view of linear algebra and the study of inner products. And then you, re you will realize that when you deal with inner products and co in the context of complex numbers, there is that conjugate sitting right there in the definition of the inner product. And so this expression will once again be natural from the linear algebra point of view. OK, now, now let me exalt the virtues of the complex series versus the real series. The only con is that you might have to take a moment, a couple of weeks maybe, to get used to this. You might still not be 100% comfortable with, with complex numbers, but that comes with time. You'll get used to complex numbers, and then this will be no more, um, what's the right word? No more uncomfortable than the real series. So with that one caveat, there are only advantages. Advantage number one, I mean, just look at it, right? Isn't it gorgeous? Do you agree with me in terms of simplicity? It's absolutely breathtaking. That's number one. Number two, just the simplicity of it. Instead of having three different things and three different corresponding formulas, you have one thing and one corresponding formula for all the coefficients. That's advantage number two. Advantage number three is that even if these were more monolithic, they still involve trigonometric functions. And even though I love trigonometry, I still have to admit that trigonometric functions are more cumbersome than exponentials. The, the names are longer, the expressions are longer, the formulas for manipulating these functions are more cumbersome, all compared to exponentials. So these are much simpler, more compact, easier to work with functions. And the related advantage is that this is, this, excuse me, I'll point right here. This almost looks like a power series. No, it doesn't almost like a power series. It's exactly a power series. Right? If you call e to the i alpha x, then this is just c sub n times x to the n. So instead of being a trigonometric series, which is kind of like a power series, but not really, this is literally a power series, just like what you, used, what you studied in Calculus 3 at Drexel, if you did. And if you imagine that all of these coefficients are 1, then you have a geometric series, geometric progression, which you can add up easily, which will come in handy, hopefully, by the end of this lecture. And finally, there are situations where the function that you're expanding might be complex in the first place. Well, before you couldn't do it with just sines and cosines because those are real. Now you can. So nothing but advantages. And let me go back to number one. And undeniable beauty. Beauty of simplicity. So whenever possible, when we have a function, even if it's a real function, we will write it as a complex Fourier series. And the symmetry that we'll observe is that the positive C sub positive ends and C sub negative ends are the complex conjugates of each other. And so when you, if you imagine zeros here, here's the positive terms and here's the negative terms, you just pair them up like this and the complex part and the imaginary parts keep canceling and you're only left with real parts. So you don't really 
have to deal with the complexity of it. It's just that there's this beautiful symmetry that just releases whatever kinks there are in the real, in the real formulation. So there is, once you see this, there is no going back on complex numbers. You will never, once you see this, you will never use the real series, the real Fourier series again. Unless, of course, you're doing it on the computer, and then you might have to think about, well, there are twice as many terms, even though many of them cancel. It's still more memory, more operations. Maybe I want to be more efficient, and that's what computer codes do. So computer codes don't go to this double the complexity just for the beauty of it. Actually, my computer codes do. But if you want to write a code that's twice as fast, you wouldn't do this. But that might be the only reason. Okay? So that's it. This completes the complex Fourier series.